While breaking down digestive starch and digestive glycogen is not regulated, breaking down storage glycogen that the body makes is highly regulated. And that regulation is going to come in force with glycogen phosphorylase. This is an image here of the enzyme, so this is a little bit of a different uh, representation than we've seen before. Uh, so here, cylinders are your uh, alpha helices. The main things here is, is that it does have a glycogen binding site, uh, as well as a site for pyridoxal phosphate. Uh, so that's another cofactor uh, that's used uh, for catalysis. There's also allosteric sites here, uh, and what's shown here with all the cylinders is actually a monomer. That tower helix uh, is one that is found in each subunit. Uh, glycogen phosphorylase is actually a dimer, and those tower helices are what basically reach out to the other dimer uh, to form connections uh, between the two of them. These two dimers are identical. So unlike hemoglobin where we saw different chains, here in this dimer, those two subunits are actually identical. Each subunit is going to have an active site as well as an allosteric effector site that's near the interface between the two subunits. Part of why that tower helix is really important to note where that is, because the tower helix is a little bit easier to find um, than this little gap where the allosteric effector site is. In addition to having allosteric regulation mechanisms, this is also going to be covalently regulated with phosphorylation, specifically the serine 14 on each subunit. Uh, so since those two subunits are identical, you're going to have one serine 14 on each one of them that can be phosphorylated. Uh, the glycogen binding site will also help uh, exert that regulatory control over this. I mentioned before that tower helix uh, is going to go between the two subunits to basically reach out to the other half of the dimer. Since glycogen phosphorylase is breaking down glycogen, it's releasing phosphorylated glucose into the cell. Because of that uh, release of phosphorylated glucose, whenever you have high energy, uh, glycogen breakdown is going to be inhibited overall. And so that therefore should also inhibit glycogen phosphorylase. Whenever we have low energy, uh, this should stimulate glycogen breakdown. So when we look at this, uh, we're going to actually see cooperativity here uh, with uh, muscle glycogen phosphorylase. Uh, both ATP and glucose 6-phosphate are going to be allosteric inhibitors. So thinking again of ATP as well as glucose 6-phosphate, um, ATP is a high energy signal and glucose 6-phosphate is a part of glycolysis that happens relatively early on in the steps for glycolysis. So both of those are going to be telling the cell that we have enough and so it's going to inhibit glycogen phosphorylase, inhibit glycogen breakdown. AMP is an allosteric activator. So AMP being the low energy signal is going to activate glycogen phosphorylase. When we're talking about this regulation, we're going to go back to talking about that MWC model because we can talk about the T and the R form of this. So there is this, the, the taut, the less active form, as well as a more active form. Uh, AMP is going to promote the conversion to the more active form. So again, this is all by allosteric regulation. Uh, ATP, glucose 6-phosphate, and caffeine actually favor conver conversion to the inactive form. Uh, one thing uh, with glycogen phosphorylase regulation, there are a lot of molecules that can cause inhibition, um, as well as a number that are allosteric effectors. So there's a lot of different compounds that go into this. That inner conversion between the T state and the R state is fairly significant. That's not a small change, it's a fairly large conformational change. Uh, and that conformational change is linked to those active sites that affect catalysis. So I mentioned that there's that serine-14 residue that's going to be able to be phosphorylated. Uh, that phosphorylation is so significant uh, that they actually name the phosphorylated form A and the, and the without the phosphorylated form B because A and B have such distinct differences both in activity as well as uh, conformation changes. The major difference in activity with phosphorylase A, once it's phosphorylated uh, into the A form, it essentially is not nearly so sensitive to regulation. So there still are those effector sites, but they just don't work nearly as well. So when you're looking at this, notice that phosphorylase B on the left-hand side shows well still the diagram we saw before, where you have A and P being an activator, ATP, glucose 6-phosphate, glucose caffeine, all being inhibitors, things that will help slow down that activity. Versus once it's phosphorylated, 
caffeine and glucose will still help keep it in the taut in that inactive form, but it's lost a lot of the um, effector sites and lost a lot of the sensitivity uh, to some of those other effector molecules. So essentially, once you have the covalent control of adding a phosphate group to glycogen phosphorylase, it's just a lot harder to control. Uh, it's therefore most likely to be in that on position. So once it's phosphorylated, glycogen phosphorylase is a go, go, go kind of an enzyme. To keep up with that notion that, that phos phosphorylase A, that is once it's phosphorylated, uh, it's going to be shifted again to that R form, away from the T form. So it's going to be more in that R form, that more active form. So this is going to reduce that value when we need to talk about that ratio between the taut and the relaxed form uh, in that MWC model. Since this enzyme can be phosphorylated, that means we also need to talk about how this gets phosphorylated. So there's going to be a phosphorylase kinase that would phosphorylate the glycogen phosphorylase, and that itself is regulated by phosphorylation. Um, the cell uses phosphorylation a lot. This is why diagrams are really helpful. We're actually going to start by looking at what happens on the outside of the cell. So you either have, so you have some sort of hormone, so sometimes epinephrine or adrenaline as well, or glucagon, which that is going to activate an adenyl cyclase. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but the adenyl cyclase will basically take ATP and make it into CAMP, which is a very specific molecule that is a low energy molecule. So CAMP in the cell, uh, also known as CAMP, uh, is a molecule that basically runs around and says, we're low on energy, we're low on energy. Once we have that CAMP, that's going to then activate a CAMP-dependent protein kinase. Once that kinase is active, that kinase will then activate phosphorylase kinase into an active phosphorylase kinase by phosphorylation, which then will go ahead and phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase B into glycogen phosphorylase A. Since there are two subunits in glycogen phosphorylase, it's going to take two rounds of ATP to completely phosphorylate both parts um, of that enzyme since it's a dimer. A reminder that glucagon is made in response to low blood sugar. So glucagon, that low blood sugar signal is going to stimulate, hey, we need more glucose in the blood. Adrenaline is that fight or flight mechanism. So once you have that epinephrine or adrenaline, that's preparing the body for action of some sort. Glucagon secretion is actually inhibited by insulin. Uh, so in diabetics, you actually get it, that glycogen is degraded even when the glucose is high. Taking a closer look, uh, if you guys have not seen CAMP before, so CAMP is a second messenger. So what this does is it actually takes ATP and it basically forms um, that small uh, circle by basically having this one phosphate group that is attached to two different hydroxyl groups um, on that ribose ring. And more importantly, it's a second messenger, and so it's going to transduce that message of the hormone. Uh, so knowing that cyclic AMP is a second messenger is the major important part here. I mostly like this in here so that you realize it's not some random molecule, and it's very intimately related to all those energy stores of ATP. So adenyl cyclase is actually a membrane is membrane associated. So in order to get that CAMP signal, we need adenyl cyclase, which is associated to the membrane. This mechanism that is going to amplify the signal, one hormone receptor complex can activate lots of G proteins and many CAMP molecules can be synthesized before the G protein disassociates. So what happens here is you have the hormone binds to the receptor that then uh, is coupled to G proteins. That then will activate those G proteins, which will then activate the adenyl cyclase, uh, which the adenyl cyclase then will take ATP to CAMP. So whenever we talk about amplification of signal, we're talking about the idea that one hormone signal will actually uh, affect multiple things inside of a cell. Uh, so you get this notion that you may only have what, that one molecule of glucagon, but that's going to affect multiple things in the cell, which then in turn affect multiple things beneath that. And so you get this cascade effect where you have the signal being um, seen in lots of places in the cell all at one time. That CAMP molecule is an important because it's going to activate the protein kinase, which can then phosphorylate our um, next protein down the line. So CAMP is going to activate CAMP-dependent protein kinase. Uh, this CAMP binding is going to cause disassociation of the C unit. So we haven't seen this in a while, but these are those regulatory molecules that they kind of hang out attached. 
two other um, basically two sets of proteins attached to each other and then once the camp binds they essentially release so you get that disassociation of the C unit when camp binds and then what's left is this active kinase which can then phosphorylate the phosphorylase kinase so this is that example of enzyme regulation by binding of a regulatory protein and you'll notice we're almost back to uh, that glycogen phosphorylase but this is still that step to activate the phosphorylase kinase and the phosphorylase kinase will then phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase so i just wanted to go back to this slide for just a moment to again show that what we were looking at again was that hormone activating adenyl cyclase which then makes the camp the camp then activates a another protein kinase and that protein kinase then activates a very specific enzyme which is the phosphorylase kinase and that phosphorylase kinase will then go ahead and phosphorylate glycogen phosphorylase yes that's a lot even though it's a lot realize that this is how the cell manages to have these coordinated efforts because every time you see this one arrow realize that this is happening multiple times over so instead of it affecting one single enzyme or one single part in any particular step this is again that notion that every time you see an arrow it's happening multiple times so that the whole cell has this suddenly now we're going to go into breakdown glycogen mode